Good morning. Welcome to St. Matthew's uh, on this, this Sunday. Uh, we, we're observing a few different things uh, in, this, in this service. This, that we're recording this service on a Thursday. This, is, this day marks the one-year anniversary of the beginning of this, uh, of this global pandemic. So we, um, we are united in prayer um, with, with churches and with, with people all over the world as we, as we are mindful of, of um, all those that we have lost, the, the time we have lost. The, um, this has been a very, very difficult year for, for all of us. And I know we're all doing our very best in this time, but it's important for us as a church and as individuals to also um, appropriately grieve um, this, this time as well. So I, I invite you to, uh, to be mindful and we're mindful of that. I also have to say, this also marks the, uh, a pretty, the first really uh, almost kind of warm, uh, warm day in this, in this, that's broken this, this pretty uh, harsh winter. And so I have to tell you, all sorts of folks at St. Matthew's have been turning up this morning. Um, to, to say hello, and, and we've, we, uh, we got off to a late start for this service because it sure is exciting to see people. <laughs> so uh, with that, I am going to uh, invite you to, uh, to sing a hymn, Lord Jesus, Think on Me. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
A reading from the Book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go to the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed to the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person who would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim that he redeemed them from the hand of the foe. He gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took to rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. Therefore, O manner of fool, and drew near to death's door. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them, and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy, and the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and, and tell, tell of his acts with shouts of joy. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. You were dead through the tre trespasses and sins in which you once lived followed the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By Christ you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the Church. Thanks be to God. I now invite you to sing another hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the third chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning at the 14th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed but those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so this is one of those iconic passages, right, in, in, in Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Uh, many folks I know are really happy to add that God did not, to continue rather, that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So, um, the, the challenge, of course, I, I, I sometimes find it's easier to preach on passages that nobody remembers uh, because we can kind of um, look at the text again with, with fresh eyes and, and see what that text has to say to us. Um, it can be sometimes harder to, to preach on these iconic passages because so much weight sits on them, the weight of memory, the weight of um, centuries of doctrine, the weight of, of other, um, all sorts of sermons and ideas that we've heard in these passages. With John 3.16, I don't know if it still happens, but it was really popular for a while for that sign to be held up at like sporting events and things. You'd see John 3.16 as this sort of attempt to, to, uh, to bring the Bible, I guess, into various places. And, uh, and, of course, you know, the person with that sign has a particular reading of what that text means, and, and uh, so does everybody else. So, so I want to, like, like I try to do every week, I really want to approach this text from a fresh perspective, because um, this is one of the most uh, enchanting uh, conversations that happens in the Gospel of John, and it captures our imagination, and it has captured the imagination of Christians for 2,000 years. This is a part of a conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. Jesus has just done what he, he, he's gone down to Jerusalem at the very beginning of his ministry. He's just kind of getting a sense of who he is in his ministry in this gospel. Although in John's gospel, Jesus very clearly has a clear sense of exactly who he is the entire time. And he's gone down to Jerusalem. And then that night, after he's thrown out the money changers and the, the, uh, the animals, uh, and all the rest of it, and kind of establishes himself. That night, he's visited by uh, a Pharisee, a leader of, of the Judeans. That's a translation that I, I favor, rather than leader of the Jews. Uh, in John's Gospel, it's often very appropriate to use the translation Judeans. Um, so he's a leader of the Judeans, because Jerusalem's in Judea. Jesus is a Galilean. He's a leader of the Judeans, and he's come to Jesus at night because he's intrigued by what he has to say. And, and of course, when Jesus starts to explain um, that you need to be born from above and born of water and spirit, baptized in water and spirit, Jesus, uh, and Nicodemus is, is, um, is confused. 
and and Jesus sort of in God, John's gospel Jesus rarely stops and clarifies but often just kind of goes on and and offers these sort of wondrous mysterious things whenever you're reading the gospel of John sometimes it's fun to put on a lens and you're imagining that it's it's God himself right the God the creator of all that is the God the, the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob a God that 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 in in, in throughout scripture and throughout the Hebrew scriptures um, one cannot simply look upon the face of God right just the idea of God being a still small voice uh, or silence or or maybe being able to catch the 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 back of, of, of God as he walks by just a glimpse just a glimpse of the Holy One it is the most that we could even the most holy of us could ever hope to have right a god who's represented in the temple by an empty throne right recall that the ark of the covenant um, rather than all the other religions of the world where there's a great golden statue of their god um, for the the israelites the it was god is simply uh, represented as a, there's an empty throne the ark of the covenant and they carry the empty throne uh into battle or into the temple and that's the place where where God dwells, because God cannot even be um, there cannot be even an image of, of God that would that would become an idol, right? So all of that stuff is happening in this in this conversation. We who know exactly who Jesus is as the embodied Word of God uh, that's the, that was a part of uh, the universe when everything was made is now sitting across from Nicodemus, this this uh, this Pharisee. And he's trying to, to understand the mysteries of the divine, and the divine uh, it's, it, itself, himself, uh, herself, right? The divine is speaking back to Nicodemus and trying to explain uh, the ways of the world. And it's, it's a, from that lens, it's this enchanting, strange conversation uh, as he tries to understand what, what Jesus is talking about. Um, so the first thing that I want to tackle in this is, 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 um, is there's this discussion about eternal life, uh, where we, we hear about, um, anyone that believes in him, that the, the passage that we have, everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. That's how it's translated. But if we get into the, into the Greek a little bit, we had fun with this at our Bible study on on wednesday there there's something that's happened um i guess just to back up a little bit more i'll, I'll be doing this a bit in this sermon because i'm trying to i'm trying to like get everything in here um we we're we're in a culture that's become fixated with uh a lot of christians and a lot of people in our culture and in our very individualistic culture that you get eternal life and i get eternal life how do I get eternal life, right? The gospel is about me. How do I get it? What do I need to do to get it? And what's happening in this passage is not about how do you, how does Nicodemus get it? How, do, how, does, how does Jeff get it? But rather, there is eternal life, which is to say there is some life that does not have a beginning and does not have an end. There is a life that participates in eternity. That Jesus links in this gospel to, to light and truth and God. There is a kind of life. Life by its very nature is something that has a beginning and an end. Right? Every living thing on this earth uh, is born and dies. Right? There's everything has a beginning and an end just in the physical universe. But Jesus is saying there is some life that is eternal. That did not begin and did not end. And you, as a person, as a created being that we're reminded on Ash Wednesday is, is made of dust, and to dust we shall return, we who are a part of God's creatures can, through God, participate in a life that, that belongs to eternity, that is eternal. And we can participate in that. We can become a part of that. We have some kind of access to this eternal life. It's not for you. It's there's, there's this eternal life that exists that's out there that God has made. And if you're, and, and, and 
And we all can, through these words of Jesus that he's saying, there's a, there's a pathway that we can take that can lead us to participate in this eternal life. I think that's what, he's, that's what Jesus is talking about. That's the first, I think that's the first piece that needs to be clarified in this text. The second image that Jesus uses that I think is so important and so interesting, he says before, he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life, may participate in it. So, th so there's a link there between Jesus being lifted up and our, participate, our participation in this eternal life, this life that is, that is linked to God that is linked to eternity. So what does Jesus mean there? Well, we, we just heard from the passage in Numbers, because uh, the lectionary folks, they, they have it together and they, they anticipated this. So the, the Old Testament passage we just heard from, from Numbers describes this encounter when the people of Israel, they're in exile and they're going around and there are these, these snakes, these, these terrible snakes. If you get into the, uh, I was, Kevin Flynn was leading us through this very interesting translation of serpent. Apparently these were not regular snakes. They were uh, seraph snakes. They were enchanted uh, snakes of some kind. Very, very sinister uh, snakes. And uh, they, the people needed to be protected from them. They were, they were uh, attacking folks. And so, um, so God invites Moses to, to lift up this staff, which is a representation of the serpents. It's, a, it's a, made in the image of these, of these serpents, and people simply had to look upon this, this staff, and they would be, and they would be saved. And John is saying um, that, that, that the same thing happens with Jesus when he's lifted up. This is very likely an allusion to the cross. When Jesus, the crucified Christ, is lifted up, uh, then we are saved. What does that mean? Well, uh, a wonderful interpretation of that, in my opinion, uh, that I heard from someone, is, um, is the cross represents all it, it represents those things that we are terrified of in in our day certainly in the time of jesus the cross represents violence and torture the cross represents humiliation it represents being uh, cast out from your society uh, being rejected by everyone being um, dying in in shame uh, and it represents tyranny and the most vile tortures that, that human beings could come up with. The cross was the culmination of centuries of terrible, terrible torture and bloodshed. It's an elegant symbol of, of evil and death and all and degradation. All the worst aspects of humanity um, distilled into one uh, symbol. And yet, that symbol is worn by millions of people throughout the world. That symbol is, uh, is held up throughout every, every church throughout the world. It has become a symbol of life and joy and hope because Jesus, uh, combined with that symbol of the cross, uh, represents a total victory over all those same things. Through the cross of Jesus, uh, through by, by viewing all of those evils through the life of Jesus, we know that all of those, those forces can be vanquished and can be destroyed. I mean, there's, if you want to get, there's a deeper level that we can go with that, right? Which is, which is that if we start thinking about what, what would that mean for us in our world today, John, John links the symbol of the cross uh, to, to light and darkness. Uh, we, we hear uh, through the words of Jesus, all those who um, do evil hate the light and do not, do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. There's something enormously powerful about taking those things that we are the most afraid of in this world and bringing them into the light and showing them for what they are. You can think about all the things that's happening, all the conversations happening throughout the world around things like all the themes around white supremacy, right? 
How does racism and intolerance survive? It, it, it survives in the shadows. It, it survives in secret conversations and, and whispered comments and all sorts of nefarious uh, back, uh, backroom deals. And by many people saying it's not real, it doesn't exist, that's not what's happening here. You're misunderstanding uh, what's happening here. That's, that's, these are all evil survives in the shadows and in the darkness. And when it's brought into the light, and we see very clearly evil that is happening in this world, uh, there is something that happens to darkness and evil when it is, is exposed clearly for the world to see. It doesn't survive very well under bright light. And it withers away. So there's a, there's a link between all of the, the, the terrifying evil of the cross in ancient Rome um, being mocked and destroyed by those first few centuries of Christians. Uh, all of that, that, that fearful symbol becoming a symbol of hope and joy and resurrection and new life. Um, the church has an obligation to constantly do that same stuff in our world today. We have, a, we have an important obligation as a faith community to constantly bring to the light those, those sinister things, those, those um, dark things that, that need to dwell in the dark. So I will tell you that I've struggled to come up with a way to uh, conclude this sermon because much like Nicodemus in his sincere search to understand the mind of God, I have too been confused. Um, Jesus replies to Nicodemus earlier in this passage. He says, um, when, after he finishes saying to him, um, we need to be born from above, um, he says, truly, truly, I tell you, unless... Uh, someone is born of water and spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed, because I've told you it is necessary for you, for you to be born from above. This is the key here that confuses me. And I'm using this wonderful uh, translation. I'll include the, a link to it in the, in the notes below. The spirit respires where it will. We often use a translation, the wind blows where it wills, but actually the wind and spirit have the same word in Greek. The spirit respires where it will, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Such is everyone born of the spirit. Here's the thing. Um, at the end of the day, when we're talking about this eternal life, and we're trying to pin it down, and catch it, and have it, possess it. We will not be able to do that because this eternal life is like the wind. It's a spirit, it blows where it wills. Uh, every generation, every, every year, every, uh, the, the spirit is doing new things. This eternal life, it is participating in new stuff. We build grand institutions to try to contain this spirit, and we fail. We try to devote our lives to certain, uh, certain pathways, and God will ask us to head down a different path. Um, the, God is doing what God is doing, and um, there is not going to be any one clear, uh, concise way to describe the mind of God and the pathway of the wind of the Holy Spirit. God's going to do what God's going to do. We, we simply have these markers. We know that God is a God of love. We, we know that God uh, is found in truth. We know that God loves the world, the cosmos that God has made, and it is good. We know that, yes, God contains all earthly things, but God is found in things beyond our earthly realm. And so we can encounter God in beautiful earthly things and new babies being born and new life and forests and streams. We can also encounter God in spirited debate and discussion, in great music, 
and the great symphonies of the, of the world in, in philosophy and mathematics and art, in all sorts of inevitable things that are um, beyond our ability to fully capture or understand. God is found in all those things as well. So I, I really want, I, I often in my sermons want to bring us back to some sort of tangible thing, but I think the gospel is inviting us to, to end this gospel slightly confused and baffled and wondering where is the Spirit of God leading us today? So that's where I'm going to leave us. Amen. Okay. I now invite you to say with me the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare for the Paschal Feast, let us lift up our prayers to God for all peoples everywhere, using our words, Lord, have mercy. For Shane, our bishop, for Jeff, our rector, for Alan, Barry, Kevin, and Jim, our honorary assistants, for this holy gathering, and for the people of God in every place. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, sharing the death and resurrection of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In our worldwide Anglican cycle of prayer, for the Iglesia Anglicana de Chile, in our Diocese of Ottawa, for St. Paul's Almont, in our Companion Diocese of Jerusalem and the Middle East, for St. Paul's Church Shafa Amr in Israel, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For all peoples on earth and their leaders, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For all who are sick, wandering, afflicted, suffering famine, or oppressed. For the people of Myanmar, suffering under a brutal military coup. For all suffering oppression outside the glare of the daily news cycle. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in our parish, who are in need, and those who are ill, John, Becky, Lucas, Callum, Anne, Lelia, Grace, Eric, Emma, Judith, Malachi, Peter, Andy, Jonan, Laura, Anna, Catherine, Ashton, Marta, Dawn, Sheila, Rabbi Reuven Bulka, and those known to us alone, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have been infected by the pandemic, whose loved ones have been effect, infected, for all struggling with isolation and missing church and community, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who rest in Christ and for all the dead, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, our families, our companions, and all those whom we love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Blessed are you, God of Moses, who sent the light into the world. 
Receive the prayers we offer this day for those in need in every place and anoint the head of all who come to your table. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Okay. Um, before the recessional ham, two quick announcements. One, if you want to pick up your church envelopes, um, they're going to be available for pickup on Monday, March the 15th, and Wednesday, March the 17th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. There's, the back door is going to be unlocked, and you can come in, and Rabina will give you your box of envelopes. So not Tuesday. Monday, March 15th, and Wednesday, March 17th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. It's in the bulletin, if you to clarify that. And the, we have a parish newsletter, and the latest issue is going to be published relatively soon. So there's a deadline for submissions, and that deadline is March the 19th for Pulse of the Parish. There's a lot more information about everything going on in the parish in the bulletin, and I commend that to you. And, uh, and that's it. So let's sing together our recessional hymn. It's a classic. Uh, o Christ, the Great Foundation.
This service has ended, but your service has just begun. Go into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.